So the <clears throat> most important first thing to notice is the drawings of the three kitties, courtesy of my wife. This is Buttercup, mm, Butter. that's Harry Boxley, and this is Novella. That's actually a pile of vomit in front of Harry Boxley because he uh, binges and purges. And this is uh, streaks of blood in front of Novella. Because, uh, okay. So, problem number one. You have two parallel plates, each with surface area A. The distance between the plates is D, and D is a D squared is a lot less than A, right? So if I try to draw this in 3D, right? So here's a plate that's got surface area A, right? So it might be root A by root A in size. And then I say two parallel plates. What that means is that the second plate is like that beneath it, and the distance between them is D. And the idea is that this D is small, small enough that the infinite plate approximation we talked about in class still works. One plate has charge plus Q spread uniformly on it, so let's just say that's this one. So it's plus Q spread uniformly over the plate, and the other charge has minus Q. You may assume that they're close together, I say that. What is the electric field between the plates? All right, so we know, well, what's the first thing we know is that if you just have one plate that's got, say, positive charge on it, in class, I told you, oh, so what's going to happen is you're going to have an electric field that is perpendicular to the surface of the plate. It's going to point away from the positive charge. If this was negative charge, it would point towards it. This electric field, and if we call this the y hat direction for this picture over here, is going to be equal to 2 pi times k times q over a. And that'll be in the y hat direction to make it perpendicular to that plate. Now, there's an important thing to realize about this is that this is the result of applying the principle of superposition a lot. The principle of superposition says is that if I have more than one charge and I want to find the electric field here, what I do is I take the electric field from just that charge, I take the electric field from just that charge, and then I do the vector sum of the two, so I pick up that vector, go there, and the net electric field will be the vector sum of the two. So this is the vector sum of all the sums of all the tiny little charges everywhere on the area. If you do that, which requires calculus to do, and there are other more fancy ways to do it if you ever take a more advanced d &M class, but you could do it with, do all the calculus, you work out, that is what the electric field is, from one plate. Now, if I had another plate, I'm going to use a different color because I like colors, if I had another plate, and so think of this as a completely separate picture, although I'm, I, there's a reason why I'm drawing them together, that had negative charge everywhere on it, I can use the same equation, except in this case, E, so let's so this one has negative Q on it, from just this guy would be 2 pi K times Q over A, but now in the minus Y hat direction, right? So that, um, I totally lied to you. It's, um, 2 pi k minus q, right, because that's the charge on it, and it's in the minus y hat direction below, because that is the direction, the perpendicular direction away from the plate below is minus y hat, right, because below the plate. But I also have a minus on the q, so this works out to be just 2 pi k q over a y hat, because the two negatives multiply together and get rid of each other. So if I just had the negative plate, it would be that. If I just had the positive plate, it would be this. So given that I have both and that, everywhere between them, except near the edges, but let's not worry about the edges, everywhere in between them, the approximation that the distance from the edge and the distance you are away from the plate has to be small compared to the size of the plate, I can keep using the principle of superposition. This is the result of the sum of all these, this is the result of the sum of all these. So the sum of these plus these is this plus this. Right? That is just saying that A plus B plus C plus D, I could do A plus B first and then C plus D, right? Because that's summing just works. That's the associative principle for summing. Well, it's the same thing here. I use the principle of superposition to get this much, principle of superposition to get this much add the two together, I know you have used the principle of superposition for the whole thing. So if I define x and y like that for the blue thing, now notice there's something different here. I put the positive plate 
on the bottom and the negative plate on the top. Here I put the positive plate on the top. So we just know that the electric field between these two plates are everywhere. Right? So now I'm, I'm not going to draw all of it because it would take too long. But imagine I drew all those arrows. The electric field between it everywhere is going to point away from the positive and towards the negative. So if I define my axes like that, I know that this electric field is just going to be pi k q over a, but it's down now because of where the positive and negative is, so it's going to be minus pi k q over a y hat. That will be the total electric field, and um, that is the result of the fact that there is a 2 pi k from one and a 2 pi k from the other, and 2 plus 2 is 1. So I lied to you, so it is minus 4 pi k because 2 plus 2 is in fact 4. So that is what the electric field is between the two when you add these two together. That's the first problem. In the second problem, we have a big conductor, a blob of conducting material. All right, so imagine this is just sort of a hunk of metal of some sort. And there are two charges, so there's no net charge on the metal. So if I add up all the charge within the metal, wherever it is, that sum will come to zero. There's just as much positive as negative. And then two external charges outside the metal that are fixed in place one way or another, or just right now they happen to be here and there. Um, plus Q2 and minus Q1. Now, uh, just to make sure it's clear what we say, when I say this, I'm trying to make it clear that I want this to be a negative charge and this a positive charge. They also don't have to have the same magnitude, because notice I gave them different names, Q1 and Q2. Q1, if I actually were to put in a number for it, Q1 would itself be positive. Because the charge on this is negative Q1. If I put in a negative number for Q1, I would have negative negative something. This would have come out positive. So if I were to substitute in for Q1, I'd have to make sure to substitute a positive number, because I already have a negative sign there to make this charge negative. So Q1 is a variable that's amount of charge. This charge, charged particle, has charge negative Q1. All right, so having said that, there are three questions. First, assume the metal is at equilibrium. It will reach equilibrium very quickly. Show where the XF charges, both positive and negative, will build up on the metal. So if we remember what happened, so here's the thing. Um, conductor versus insulator, uh, there's really sort of, there's one big difference and then one additional thing you have to think about with insulators. The huge difference and almost everything that, that we talk about with electric fields and materials follows from this difference. Um, and this is sort of the most simple view of it, and you can find cases where like there's semiconductors and things that are more complicated, but the sort of the quickest simple view that actually gets you very far in thinking about how materials work is that inside a conductor, charges can move freely, right? There's an electric field, there's gonna be a force on the charge, it's gonna accelerate, it's gone, it's going, bye, see ya. Whereas in an insulator, a charge cannot move freely. So if you manage to get some excess charge, say, on the surface of an insulator or even inside an insulator, how did you do that? Lots of ways. If you rub fur on a plastic rod, you get some charge on it. Maybe you injected charge inside somehow. Who knows? However you get charge on an insulator, if you have excess charge on it, it'll stay put to start with. Right? So that's an insulator. If you get charge on it, it stays put. The other thing about insulators is induced dipoles, but we'll come back to that a little bit later. This is a conductor. Charges can move freely. So if you just think about it, like when it's not at equilibrium, right here, there's an electric field that points away from this charge, and there'll be the other one that points towards that charge. So there'll be a net electric field that way, which will push positive charge this way and push negative charge that way. Now, one of the things I told you in class is that if there is either excess charge or asymmetrical charge on a conductor, the, the excess, positive or negative, will build up on the surface. Why? Because if it was somewhere in the middle, there'd be an electric field as a result of that, and it would move. Right? So everywhere in the middle has to be neutral, because if it weren't neutral in the middle, there'd be an electric, charge, electric field that would push charges around, and that means it wouldn't be at equilibrium. So once it reaches equilibrium, it's got to be neutral everywhere inside but on the surface you can have excess charge. So let's just think about what's gonna happen. If you wanna make the total electric field zero here, you're gonna to wanna to sort of shield it from this positive charge, and the way you could do that is by building up some negative charge right here. You know, probably it'll mostly build up closest to the positive charge, and there might be a little around there. Um, actually figuring it out for real is, is pretty intense, so I'm not gonna make you do that. This is more a qualitative kind of thing. But since the total charge of this is negative, and I, or sorry, zero, I have some negative charge here, there, there must be some net positive charge somewhere to offset that. Well, it's the same thing here. If I want the electric field right here to be zero, 
there's a field that way as a result of this negative charge. There has to be something to go that way to offset it. Another way of thinking about that is you want to sort of shield it from this negative charge so it doesn't see it. So what that means is that you can build up all the positive charge sort of right there. And so this is what you would expect to happen, is that inside this conductor, the positive charges are pulled this way towards the negative external charge. Why? Because the electric field's that way. Sorry, the electric field that way pushes the positive charge, and the electric field that way pushes the negative charge that way, so the negative charges will tend to build up here. So that is qualitatively what you would expect for this charge distribution. So next, pick a random spot somewhere inside the metal. Like, say, here. That's the spot I picked. Draw vectors representing each of the following. So E1, due to minus Q1, I'm going to get E2 due to plus Q2, and then E3 due to charges that have moved around and separated in the metal. All right, and that sounds hard, but it's not. So here's what we're going to do, is we're going to start with E1. All right. So at this point, and so remember, the principle of superposition, and these are going to be all the risks because there's no other charges, so the total electric field should be the sum of these three. So this is the contribution just due to negative Q1. Well, we know it's going to be along this line because that's a point charge. So the electric field just due to Q1 will be like that in that direction, right? And then the electric field just due to Q2, well, you know it has to point away from Q2 because now this is a positive charge. It's also probably a little closer to Q2 than Q1. We don't know the relative magnitudes, so let's just pretend to say that Q2 is bigger than Q1, right? So that's probably going to be that way. So this is E2. I don't think I drew a 1 on there, but that's what that was. I'm hopefully making the colors suggestive. All right, so that's E1 and E2. Great. How do you figure out E3? You think, well, it's going to point away from this and towards this, and I can kind of guess, but did I really draw these in the right place? I don't know. But there's another way you can do this, and that is we know that the total electric, there it goes, we know that the total electric field right there for a conductor in equilibrium has to be zero, which is also equal to E1 plus E2 plus E3, because those are all the things contributing to the electric field. Right? So that tells us that E3 has to equal minus E1 minus E2, right? or another way of writing that is minus E1 plus E2. And that gives us what we need to figure out what E3 has to be. Right? So what I'm going to do is do a vector sum. Just I'm going to pick up this little E1 and put it down here. right? So that's that. So then this dotted vector here, whoop, that would be E1 plus E2. That's what that dotted thing is. That's not a electric field that's actually there. That's what the sum of these two contributions are. To get a total electric field of zero, I have to cancel out these two put together. So that means I'm going to get something like that. That will be the result of the electric field from the charge separation. It's plausible, right? It's pointing towards these negative charges. It's pointing away, although not perfectly away, but notice also the negative charges are closer, so they'll probably have a stronger effect on the direction of the E field. So that's the way E3 is going to point. So it is pointing the way you'd expect from this charge distribution, but I figured it out by knowing that the total electric field inside the conductor had to be zero. So that is the second problem. A parallel plate capacitor which is something we'll talk more about and we'll even play with capacitors in lab. A parallel plate capacitor is two metal plates separated by a distance that is small in comparison to the size of one of the plates. We just talked about one of these. So I've drawn a line, but visualize this as a plate that we're sort of looking at. We've chopped it off and we're looking at a cross section of it. You put a charge plus Q on one plate and minus Q on the other plate. So there's net positive, net negative here, but the magnitude is the same on both plates. So now you could tell me if you knew the area of the plates, what the electric field is between them, because that was the last problem. The electric field in this capacitor is approximately uniform, meaning it's a very, very good approximation that's uniform everywhere except right at the edges, which is a very small fraction of the volume of it. Consider two possibilities for the capacitor. So these are my two possibilities, one and two. In one case, there was nothing between the two plates. Okay, that's just like the last problem. 
In the second plate, uh, case, the space between the plates is filled with an insulating material. Uh -huh. And now what I'm telling you, if the total electric field between the plates of the capacitor is the same in each case, in which case will the capacitor have more charge? Okay, so the first thing I want to say is, here's, this is case one, this is case two. The total electric field in both cases is the same. If I have charge, you know, plus Q1 here and minus Q1 there, and maybe a different, you know, maybe it's the same, maybe it's not, a different charge here, how does Q1 compare to Q2 is the question. So what we have to do is we have to think about what changes when you have insulating material in between the two. So here's the first thing. The only thing that gives you electric field in this case is the charge built up on the plate. So I've called this E plate. I should probably call it E plate one because it's on the left side. So E plate one is equal to E one, right? All right, so similarly on the right side, we're going to have an electric field from the plate pointing away from the positive and towards the negative. So we'll call this E plate two, but I'm not gonna say what it is just yet. Because now we need to think about, remember in class we talked about what happens when you apply an electric field to an insulator. Well, because it's an insulator, charges can't freely move, but you can induce dipoles. And so positive, so, and remember the way we visualize this is we draw these little ellipses that represent what was probably a spherical atom that gets stretched out as the positive, so say the nuclei, um, are pushed away and the negative, so the electron cloud, is pulled towards. Now, really, there's going to be huge numbers, you know, millions from, from top to bottom of these little dipoles induced. And the whole thing is going to be one continuous set of induced dipoles. So really, the whole thing becomes polarized, in a sense. This is just like if I draw, like, you know, here's a blob of water, and I draw the water molecules in it, you know the water molecules really aren't this big, right? There's an ungodly number of water molecules in here, and they're not really that big. So these dipoles are on the atomic scale. So they're really not nearly as big as we're drawing them. We're just doing this to visualize kind of which way the dipoles go. So I'm just going to draw a whole lot of dipoles in here. Plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. And all of these are there because they were induced by this external electric field. Well, it's external to the insulator because it comes from the, it was, it, the electric field comes from the charges on the plates. So now that we have those dipoles in there, there's going to be an electric field due to those dipoles. So remember, if I have a dipole, which I'm now drawing upside down to that, the electric field around the dipole I could draw a bunch of arrows, but I'll do the field line thing. Looks like this, where it's always down, and then inside the dipole too, it's always sort of down like that. Right, and it's gonna be strongest, closest to the dipole now. So if you line up a whole bunch of these dipoles all over the place, lots of stuff, all the left and right stuff certainly is gonna cancel each other out. The end result is that if you have a bunch of dipoles like this, and I'll do this one like this, where the negatives end up on the top and the positives on the bottom. Uh, minus plus, minus plus, plus, minus. Am I doing this right? Yes, plus, minus, plus, minus. Notice here, inside, there's plus and minus next to each other that'll kind of balance each other out. But you have a net minus here and a net plus here on the edges. So what that would say is you're going to have an electric field pointing that way, sort of away from the plus towards the minus, and that's kind of the same thing, right? It's going to point away from the plus towards the minus here, if you look at what we actually got for the dipole field. So that says here, you have minus on the top, plus on the bottom, that you're going to have another electric field here, which I'm going to call E dipole 2. So there was no equivalent field here because there was no insulator to polarize. So we have E dipole 2. And so then the total electric field 2, well, I'm just going to, all right, so, well, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to first say that, I don't want to erase the kitties. Um, I'm going to first say that the total electric field is the field from the external charges plus the field from the dipole. So the total electric field inside there is the vector sum of E plate 2 plus 
E dipole to. Now we know that the induced electric field is going to be smaller in magnitude than the external electric field for an insulator. Right? For a conductor, the electric field goes to zero inside the conductor, but not so for an insulator. So what I want to do, if you think about the magnitude, you're going to have E plate 2, which is these big lines, in the downward direction, and E dipole 2 in the upward direction, so it's opposite plate 2. So if you're going to get the magnitude of the vector sum, right? So I have plate 2 plus dipole 2, so this here is the vector sum of E plate 2 plus E dipole 2. Notice the magnitude is less because it's this minus that. So it's going to be this minus E dipole 2 is equal to E2, the magnitude. So if E1 is equal to E2, notice that E1 is the same as E plate 1, but E2 is equal to E plate 2 minus a thing. So for E1 to be equal to E2, E plate 2 has to be bigger than E plate 1, right? To get these two the same as each other, which also says they're the same in magnitude, right? If two vectors are the same, they have the same direction and same magnitude. So we're thinking about magnitude right now. E1 is just E plate 1. E2 is E plate 2 minus something. So E plate 2 has to be bigger so that when you subtract something off, you get back to what E plate 1 was. Knowing this, we now know that Q2 has to be bigger than Q1. Because if you remember what happens from the previous problem, the magnitude of the electric field is just proportional to Q. So the answer is, you put insulator in here, to get the same electric field, you have to put more charge on the plate. This will relate to the concept oops, of capacitance, which is the thing where we describe how big a capacitor is. Something with a higher capacitance can store more charge for the same amount of electric field. Now, when we finally get to the really, we'll talk about the energy stored in capacitors, but we haven't talked about energy and electric fields yet. So for now, we'll say, you know, the same electric field, it takes more charge to make it. And you think, well, that sounds like it's harder to get the electric field. But what you're really trying to do is store charge. Right? So you store the charge for the same amount of electric field. By putting an insulator in between, you get a higher capacitance. You store more charge. And that's why real capacitors we use in the lab always have a layer of what we call dielectric, or some sort of insulator in between the plates. That is the third problem. All right, the last problem, a little bit tricky. So I want to make sure we set it up right. Now here, reading comprehension is important because this is one where you could read it quickly and set it up wrong. Two dipoles with the same dipole moment are oriented in the same direction, right? So what we know so far is that we have a couple of dipoles, which I could just draw like that, or I could draw it like this. I'm going to draw it like that because it will make it easier to think about. And remember, they're, they're permanent dipoles, so it's like you have a charge Q separated by a distance D. So the magnitude of the dipole moment, P, is just QD in this case. So that's one of them. So two dipoles with the same moment, I should have called this negative Q down here, are oriented in the same direction. So, so far, all I can really tell you is that, you know, we have two of them like this. And are separated by a displacement parallel to the axis of their dipole moment. It's like, oh my god, that's a lot of words. I have no idea what he just said. So break it down. They are separated by a displacement. Ah, okay. So right, that's the displacement they're separated by. Parallel, oh, that it's parallel to the axis of their dipole moment. So the axis of their dipole moment is that way, which means the displacement has to be like this. So ah, that's how they're separated, right? That's what that means. So now I'm going to retraw it. Because now that I know which way it is, I think it's actually going to be easier for me, knowing where I'm going with this, to draw the two dipoles like this, so we'll call this P1 for dipole moment 1, or dipole 1 with moment P1, and here's dipole 2, P2. Knowing that P1 is equal to P2, they're just not at the same point in space. Will these dipoles attract each other, repel each other, or exert no force on each other? So there's very facile ways of thinking about this, and that is, well, positive is closest to negative, so they're going to attract. Done. Or you could say, oh, wait a minute, positive attracts negative, but positive repels positive. And negative, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, and negative repels negative, and negative repels positive. There's just as many attracts as there are repels, no force. That would be wrong, because counting isn't enough. 
So let's try to think this through. So the way you can do this is break the dipole into two point charges in each case. So the total force, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out the total force of 1 on 2. right? And the way you do that is figure out E of 1 at 2's negative charge. Then um, we call F negative is going to be minus Q of this E. So we'll call E 1 minus, right? That's the E of both of these together on this guy. Then we figure out what I'm going to call E plus 1, or E1 plus to make it the same way of saying it, of 1 at 2's plus side, right? So I say, what's the total electric field from these two things together on this side? And then I can say F plus is equal to um, plus Q E1 plus, right? And then the total force on this dipole will be the sum of those two forces. So really there's four pairs of particles we have to find forces in between. So let's start, we'll start with this. What is the four, uh, we have to figure out, I left an out out there, E1, E1 minus of 1 at 2 is negative. So that includes both of these charges, what is the electric field here? So we know there's going to be an electric field from plus here, all right? away, but then there's going to be one towards from the negative, but notice the negative charge is farther away, so that electric field will be less. So the net electric field of these two together is going to be in that direction. Right? So this is what E1 minus is. Right? The electric field at the position of the negative charge is that way. So the force is of course going to be that this is a negative charge in that, so the force 1 minus is going to be in this direction. I've drawn the arrows the same length. These two vectors have different units, so it doesn't even really make sense to compare them. But what this means is that this is the same length as this. The force of this magnitude of the force of a charge, also Q, on another electric field, I draw the arrows the same way to keep them proportionally the same. It's just a way to keep track of it. Okay, that was exciting. Next, figure out E1 plus of 1 at 2's plus position. Well, okay, so I have a plus and a plus. Well, really, I'm just figuring out the electric field. So the plus, there's going to be an electric field away here. But here's the hard part. How big is it compared to these others? Well, notice that the distance from here to here, right, from the minus to the minus, is the same as the distance from the plus to the plus. I'll just call that D, because that also happens to be the distance between the centers. right? So because all of these charges have the same magnitude Q, and because this distance from here to here is the same as this distance from here to here, the magnitude of the electric field from this guy here should be the same as the magnitude of the electric field from this guy there. So however long I drew that, that's how long I should draw this one, right? That here is that same distance. So there's an electric field that way. All right, so this is the contribution to the electric field at this position from the plus charge. And now I have to figure out what's the contribution at this position from the minus charge. Well, it's going to be that way, but smaller still because the minus charge is farther away than the plus charge. So this will be the smallest one. So the result, total electric field in this case, um, I've done something horribly wrong. Um, nope, I haven't done anything wrong at all. The total electric field at this case is this minus this, so it's going to be sort of that way. And so now the force, so what I'm calling force plus here, this was force minus, force plus is this way, and now you say, aha, look at that, there's a force to the left and a force to the right, they will cancel out. You would still be wrong. It's harder than that. Because now, we have to think, how does this difference compare to this difference? Oh, so here's what I'm going to do. Um, we're going to, I shouldn't have called this D, I'm going to call this dis distance here R, the different distance between the dipoles, and I'll call D 
the width of the dipole. So for E1 minus, what we have, that electric field, is we're going to have a K times the Q of one of the charges um, divided by, well, so we'll start with the plus to the minus. So what is the distance from here to here? Well, clearly, if from here to here is R and here to here is D, this distance from here to here is R minus D. So we're going to have 1 over R minus D squared, and that was due to the plus charge, so this will be in the plus direction. And then we have from minus to minus, we're going to have um, minus 1 over R squared, right? So um, we have a minus 1 over R because that's distance here to here. It's the electric field from a negative charge, so I would have had a negative KQ, and I factored out my KQ in front. So E1 minus looks like that. E1 plus, now let's do the same kind of thing. So the plus contribution, we're going to have a KQ because the charge of that is plus Q. The plus contribution is from here to here is a distance R, so we're going to have a 1 over R squared minus the distance from here to here, well clearly that's R plus another D, so it's minus 1 over R plus D squared. All right, so then if I put all the forces together, so F minus is going to equal minus Q times KQ, right, because it's the force on the negative charge, so I put in a minus Q there, over 1 times R minus D squared minus 1 over R squared. And then F plus is going to equal plus Q times KQ times 1 over R squared minus 1 over R plus D quantity squared. All right, and so now what I have to do is I have to sum these two together with each other. So let's just think about this. The first thing I'm going to do is factor this negative sign in. So this will become a negative there and a positive there. So the total net force is going to be KQ squared times, now notice I have a 1 over R squared and a 1 over R squared, so it's going to be 2 over R squared minus 1 over R minus D squared minus 1 over R plus D squared. And now this is hard. Here's the way I would proceed, which I don't know that I recommend for you guys, but if you know Taylor series from calculus, you can make the approximation D is a lot less than R and expand these and subtract and see what happens. But you probably think that is painful. Insofar as D is a lot less than R, if I just ignore these Ds, I have a 2 over R squared minus 1 over R squared, because I've ignored the D, minus 1 over R squared, I get zero force. Well, okay, that's what you would have expected if you have two neutral particles far apart from each other, because if D is irrelevant, it's like they're neutral particles. But the real question is, is the sum of these when you include the D bigger than small or smaller than 2 over R squared? So they not having the ability to do Taylor series, I'm going to, let's just try something. Let's guess a typical distance, right? Let's just say that R is equal to one meter and D is equal to 0 0.01 meter, right? So we've made our dipoles by separating two little charges with uh, by a centimeter, and R is one meter. And in this case, two over R squared is going to be two over one meters to the minus two, right? So I have one meter squared on the bottom, minus 1 over r minus d, and now I have to write it out because I don't know this square off the top of my head, 0.99, minus 1 over 1.01, because that's r plus d squared. Does this number come out positive or negative? Let's just try it and see what we get. If you put this into your calculator, the results you get from doing all of these is negative 6 times 10 to the minus 4 Notice it's a very small number, meters squared, meters to the minus two. Right. That's just the stuff in the parentheses. The stuff outside we know is positive. I'm a terrible person because I left off unit vectors, right? So x hat's in that direction. So I should have called, I should have had an x hat on all of these. Or really what I was doing was the x component of force. So I apologize for that. All of these are forces in the x direction. So this would have worked out in the negative x direction. That would have worked out in the plus x direction, just like I drew it. So anyway, 
apologies for the, I mean, I totally get all over you when you mix your vectors and scalars, and here I just did it, so, you know, bad Rob. Okay, back to this. So what I'm, what I'm saying is the total force here, this is a positive number, that's the x-hat direction, this will work out to negative. To really be safe, you should try a bunch of other things and make sure, and, and still you haven't proved it, you've just figured out plausibly what it probably is. To really prove it, you have to do the Taylor series expansion thing, which is more intense math than we're really doing in this class. So to really prove it, you would do that. But in this case, I put in this number, I notice it's to the left. So if the net force is to the left here, I can conclude that two dipoles oriented the same way offset along this. There's going to be a net attractive force on this dipole. There's another way you could have thought about that. And that is just remember from a dipole that if the total net electric field from this total dipole here would have been that there and that there, right? It's getting smaller with distance. So the force on the negative charge, which would have been to the left because it's opposite the electric field, right? So this is the E of the other dipole at this position. This is the E of the other dipole at this position. Because it's going down with distance, the force, the magnitude of the force on the negative charge is bigger than the magnitude of the force on the positive charge. So the attractive magnitude is bigger than the repulsion magnitude. So the net result is that it's going to attract. Right? That would have been a faster way to think it through than working through all of this. The result you get is the same, fortunately. So two dipoles oriented like this, electric dipoles will attract each other. So now you might think, what if they were oriented like this? Gee, doesn't that sound like a question that somebody ought to be able to answer? Maybe it does. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Maybe it does.